Hey, hey, ladies. Welcome back to the show. I have an incredible guest on today. Uh, she is a high-profile, multi-millionaire business mentor, spiritual boss lady, and more so known as the money queen. Um, I have had just my own experience with Amanda Francis. <laughs> so without further ado, Miss Amanda <laughs> Francis, oh, welcome. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. I'm so glad that you, um, you're you here and you're able to do this with us today. I know that you're going to provide some amazing value to our listeners. Um, so yeah, let's just, you know, dive in a little bit. Um, so awesome. just backstory, I have listened um, probably to your podcast. I came across you on Instagram a couple of years ago and I've had a lot of like, a, not a lot, a couple of like small world synchronicities with you, um, which we'll get into. But, um, you know, I am currently enrolled in your money mentality makeover program. I've gone through soul. Okay. Alive. Yeah, cool. and I've gone through soul alive too. So just really, you know, in my own, um, entrepreneurial journey, uh, I know that my challenges definitely one of the things that I had a hard time with were my money stories and my money blocks and Amanda here yeah. has definitely helped um, me with that. So thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Wait, yeah. I want to know the synchronicities. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my, so the girl that I hired to be my one-on-one -on -one coach was Erin Nicole Porter. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with her, but her one of her mentors was Melanie Lair. Uh, okay, and Melanie was my client, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So I was like, okay, there's one, and then I, um, from going through Love Is Blind um, from the show on Netflix, um, I was introduced to Nicole Moore, who is mm, yeah love coach, right? And I believe she helped you with some things. <laughs> or she worked. Yeah, with I worked with Nicole for a bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just some small world little, just, yeah. How we're, I don't know, just being. This led to the right out. stuff at the right time kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. totally. Yeah. It's like super cool. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we'll dive into a little bit, but um, yeah. So I want you to share with us like your story, like how you became the money queen. How, <laughs> how did I become the money queen? Um, I think from having a lifelong fascination and interest in money, and I think, you know, people try to act like, I don't know, that that money isn't like the thing. They don't they don't let it be the thing. We hear like, oh, like this and this and this matters so much more than money, and like money can't make you happy, and money can't keep you warm at night, and like money's the root of all evil, and we hear all this stuff, you know. And we like, don't prioritize money. And I think it was very clear in my head that I can prioritize money and prioritize it like well, and, you know, go on a bit of a mission to learn more about it, to understand it, to earn, attract and receive and generate and allow it into my life and then like use it well. And I can do all that and still be fulfilled like in every other area, you know, people act like if you receive money, then you can't also have you know, like love, fulfillment, integrity, and a happy life, you know? Right. And so I guess I've always been a bit fascinated by money. And professionally, the journey was a bit like, you know, put myself through grad school, was nannying and cocktail serving and working in retail and doing all these things while I was starting a baby life coaching business all the side. And then once I got out of grad school, I started a PhD program. So I'm like in this PhD program and I'm growing my business on the side. And I had to eventually like, you know, devote my heart to one and I picked the business. So I'm growing a coaching business and like, I'm learning how to generate more money for myself, but also like the dynamics and principles and mindsets that were supporting me in doing so. And I was kind of helping my clients with the same. And then a couple of those clients ended up starting businesses and asking for my support with online business. And I accidentally became a business coach <laughs> and I was just always the most fascinated by the money aspect. I wanted to talk to everyone about money and how they felt about it and where they had resentment with it and what their mom told them about it and like what it felt like to not let the stories be true anymore. And it was just the thing, you know, it was just always the thing. And then 
you do that for a decade and people start calling you the money queen, I guess. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So here we are. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Well, okay. So you said that you like were prioritizing money. Like what, what made you do Like tell us like who Amanda was, you know, as an eight year old, like where, where did this like fascination with money come from? Well, I think you know, me and my friends stuff and joke that my mom gave me an entire career just by being so fucked up with money. Um. And I love you, mom, if you're listening, but her thoughts <laughs> were so intense and so debilitating that it was clear to me that money was like her main problem, right? So mm -hmm. if money is the main problem of one of your caregivers, I think for me, I wondered how to solve it, you know? It was always confusing to me that she felt limited around money, that she couldn't uh, make it herself like dependent on my dad, like in kind of in like victimhood and struggle, like just never empowered around money ever, you know? And like, she, she definitely told me like, you know, <laughs> the way, well, the way she said it was never depend on a man, get a good job and make your own money or something. But the way I interpreted it is like, how can I be in control of this area of my life? Like, you know, that's like, was always what was going on inside of me. Is it through my education? Is it through the kind of jobs I pick? And I was working on being a therapist, you know, who definitely don't always make a lot of money. Sometimes right. some people structure their private practice really well and do so, but a lot of people never, ever, ever do, you know? So I was just always in this, like, how do I follow my heart? Like do the things I love and make a great income. Like what is that combination? You know, like, yeah. That was always kind of the big question. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And yeah, I mean, it does go back to that, you know, <laughs> you made me laugh when you were like, mom, if you're listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Hey mom, she does listen to stuff randomly that I, you just never know. Yeah. She listens to like a lot. If she, she could stumble <laughs> upon this. Like if you were to end up putting it on YouTube or something, she would find it. Oh, for Definitely. sure. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it might wind up on YouTube. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh. so hey mom. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, mom. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting because like going through, um, you know, your programs or listening to your podcast, obviously it helped me to make some shifts and me to be in this like wonderment, like, wait a second, like, what are, what are my money beliefs? And yes, I've worked with a coach too. And we dove into that as well. But, you know, I, I actually had a situation where I told my parents, I was like, Hey, because you said this, this is why I think this of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was like, how dare you? How dare you like tell us that we're to blame for like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, maybe that wasn't the way that I should have approached that situation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because it's not blame. It's just right. cause and effect. Like I say in my book that like everything in like everything in your reality, like everything in your life was created by you, by the thoughts in your head and your vibration and your beliefs and whatever. But it was also like co-created by the people around you. You know, they all informed your perceptions of life and how it works. And none of it was ultimately true, but it's all like within us. So it's like, no one's to blame. And, and we have ultimate responsibility as like adult humans, but like, and people told us some fucked up shit and like stuck yeah. with us, you know, <laughs> like both. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just, just the common things that we hear all the time, it's like, we can't afford that. It's too expensive. Money doesn't grow on trees. Like just that language right there is just, it, it's just a limiting belief for a majority of people out there. probably. Um, it's just, yeah. Cause it just keeps you all limiting belief is, you know, is something that keeps you in restriction and out of like the mindset of options and opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, and in the mindset of like lack and never enough, no matter what I do, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how, um, I guess like going a little bit deeper into those like money beliefs, like how do you take someone out of that place of restriction? Like what is, you know, just a simple pr process? Like obviously we have to go like deep into our money beliefs. Obviously I think that's yeah. number one, but kind of like, how do you get them like, okay, well I'm aware of this money belief, but like, how do I actually turn it? I think you cut off for a second. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I, yeah. So like the most, I would say like the a foundational element, like one of the main foundations is just letting people know that most of the things that they think aren't ultimately true. 
And it's like hard because beliefs are thoughts. You know, we keep thinking, we think it for long enough, it becomes a belief, a way we believe life in the world or work for everyone or however it goes inside of us. So like just the idea that like everything in my mind is not the ultimate truth and there there's other ways to perceive them and that will create different realities. Like just that basic foundational principle is like the most important thing. Because so many things about ourselves and what we're not capable of and what we can't have and what we can't do seem so real and it's not really based on anything, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We're and you know, like you said, we have to kind of like take, do our adult part to create new beliefs, new patterns, new behaviors, and, you know, fully rise into who we want to be as, as an adult and not what mm-hmm. we were as a child <laughs> per se through mm-hmm. the programming of our, of our parents or caregivers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So when did you, obviously you started life coaching in college. Um, so in grad school, yeah. Grad school, excuse me. So when did you like fully step into who you were? Sorry, you cannot. when did I fully step into who I am? Yeah. Yeah. Like, did you, I mean, like as beginning entrepreneurs, I mean, there's a lot of like imposter syndrome and fear and just, you know, maybe I should be doing this and this is what's going to help me be successful. You know, were there any, like, obviously it seemed like you were pretty sure of yourself, but you know, I feel like we all go through those challenging times just as an entrepreneur. So were you ever, did you ever experience that type of thing? And when did you fully feel like, no, this is what the fuck I'm supposed to do? (laughs) Totally. So I would say like 2011 and 12 were just like, okay, got to figure this out. Like, how do I get clients and get people to pay me? Like very like basic. And then like 2000, like 13 and 14 were kind of like, okay, there's this online space and I don't really know how it works, but I'm kind of beginning to understand that I can do this whole business thing on the interwebs. And like, I knew it all along, but it started to feel more like my path, you know, like more like the, the direction I was meant to go. And then I would say like 2015, was when I was like, I'm here, I'm Amanda Francis, and here's what I have to teach you, you know? And it started feeling like, this is for real. Like, I know some things, Mm -hmm. and they're meant to help people. And so I guess, from I would say from 2000, yeah, from like 2015 to now, I've probably just grown in like my, like certainty and like authority and ability to like explain and teach, you know, through just like practice and perseverance. But yeah, I've been feeling like me, like I had stepped into me. Mm-hmm. I would say probably from like, like mid 2014 or so. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So five, five and a half, six years ago. Yeah. It's been a minute now. Definitely. Yeah. That has. <laughs> that yeah. Has. And that doesn't mean I'm confident all the time, but that does mean I'm, I've been pretty sure for a long time that was like, I was on my purpose. I was doing what I was meant to do in the world, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Did your, did your parents ever, I don't know, just like, because I mean, I'll say that like for me as an entrepreneur, you know, our parents do want to keep us safe. So was there any like of those safety conversations, like, uh, like when you may not have been making money just yet in your business, like, Oh, are you sure you want to do that? Like, why don't you get like a, like stay on the career path so that you are working for someone and you have that security and everything. Was there ever conversations like that or were your parents pretty fully trusting in what you were doing and did you not care? Um, <laughs> like both, like both. I mean, when the coaching business was like a baby, I just had this role, not just for my parents, but for everyone. Like I just didn't talk to people about it. Like it felt very important to like incubate the dream. And it was none of it was no one's like business, how it was going. So when people would ask me how it was going, I'd just be like, it's good. Thanks for asking. Like, I wouldn't like tell, like, why would you tell people who are going to reinforce your doubts and fears, your doubts and fears? Like, if you want to be like disproving the doubts and fears, don't talk to people about it who are going to just tell you they're like the ultimate truth for you, you know? So I didn't really talk to anyone about much of anything, including my parents. Like I would kind of let them know as like things went well for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just kind of kept my process inside myself. It felt, it felt sacred. It felt like I had to, you know, and then I would say like over time, you know, like the, the business started being successful. Like I would say I'm having like a pretty clear memory, like around the time I was making maybe like 
6000 7000 $8,000 a month, which was like a lot for me, you know, around the time that like that was happening. I remember my dad saying, well, he, he like called me to tell me this, like, well, business is going well right now, but it might not always be going well. Here's what you got to do. You got to mm-hmm. buy a house. It was like, it was like buy a house, get a mortgage and a couple other things like I had to. And I was like, I'm good dad. It's only going to keep getting better. And I'm not ready to buy a house because I don't know where I want to live. And like, I just went on with like my whatever. And it was just out of safety and concern, right? Because for his generation, like that's what you need to do. Oh, it was insurance, health insurance and a mortgage. For his generation, like those were the things, you know, like to be a successful, stable adult, like start paying down your mortgage so it can be paid off by retirement and like make sure you have good health insurance. And also he worked for the same company his entire life who gave him health insurance, right? So it was just like his, you know, his like thinking for me. But I mean, there were, there were moments like that. And mostly I incubated the dream, you know, it's really no one, it's no one else's business and like setting boundaries around what you do and don't want to talk, talk about based on what will and won't serve you is an incredibly important life skill. Yeah, it is. I'm, I was learning boundaries this year a lot myself. So <laughs> It's, it's definitely a big one. Um, no, that's awesome. What would you say as far as like, so where I'm in my mid thirties, um, you know, speaking to our generation, you know, just like from where you're at now. And obviously like, you know, that money's always coming to you and you have these radical beliefs, but there are obviously people listening that don't, you know, or they have that, or they Mm want to have those beliefs, but they also have the fear of like, okay, you know, like even my mom has been like, you know, I don't think social security is going to be around when you're late, when, you know, when you're my age and that kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, Jesus, yeah. Yeah. And you know, a a part, a part of me, I'm like, I don't, whatever. I don't even know half of what that is. So whatever. (laughs) But, But also, you know, it's like, okay, well, what, what does my retirement look like? Like, yeah, a lot of us live a lot in the moment too. So like, can you speak to, um, I guess like what, what that future looks like in 15 years from now, you know, like where, where am I going? And like, what am I, (laughs) what does that security look like for me? Am I, I mean, I don't, I feel like for me, if I'm making radical figures year after year, then I'll be set, you know, but. Yeah. Well, like I started an I like a Roth IRA when I was like 27 and started putting money in it, letting it grow, maxing it out every year. And now I like there's caps on how much self-employed people can put toward retirement, but I have my account set up to do the max I can do. And aside from retirement accounts exclusively, like I have a significant amount of money invested in the stock market and real estate and businesses. So like, yeah, I do smart things with money, but I never would have been able to do any smart things with money if I was living in a dynamic that said like, mm-hmm. I'm a middle-class girl from Oklahoma who will never be able to have more than enough because that's not who I am. That's not where I come from or the kind of people I come from, mm-hmm. which is the reality I lived in, you know, mm-hmm. 12 years ago or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, th- I mean, that's a belief for a lot of people. I mean, is like where they grew up and how are they, how, how they were raised and they don't think that things will get better for them. They don't think that they can change their dynamic of living. Totally. Because of the identity, like we have, we have like money is so wrapped up and linked in our, linked with our identity. Like if I identified myself as someone who is this kind of person with this kind of life and this kind of income, I would have lived there forever and made choices from that place, decisions from that place, gone after things or not gone after things from that place. And instead I, decided to make all choices and go after all things from the place of someone who was becoming wealthy. That was the trajectory the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How do you, um, I guess, how do you, I know how you do this, but to our listeners that are new to you, how do you stay in that energy of like attraction of constantly making more than enough money? Well, the truth is you go out of it all the time and then you have to go back into it. But like what happens is that your default vibration increases all the time. So like right now you might be in a, your default vibration is never enough. And then you might have like moments of believing things can be better. And then you might have other moments of feeling like things are doomed, but your default is whatever your default is. So I think what has happened is over time, I've spent so much time 
thinking positive thoughts, feeling positive feelings, saying positive words to myself and reinforcing positive dynamics around money for so, 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 so long that like my dominant default vibration without trying is like, well, I'm obviously going to make like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars every month. Like that's my, like my, like my minimum standard, like, okay. So you've heard me talk about energetic minimums and maximums and set points in the book and in money mentality makeover. So like when you're like, my minimum like my fuck what went wrong this month is like three hundred thousand dollars a month like that's an insane amount of money right Mm -hmm. so when i'm working on my money beliefs and i'm intentionally putting myself in the vibration of like higher and higher and higher and higher numbers what i what i do to like break it down is i like think thoughts about it like holy shit i just had a six hundred thousand dollar month it was the biggest month we've ever had it felt so good it felt so easy it felt so fun it felt so flowy it came to me naturally it came to me easily and like i kind of like you know go on a tangent either with words like i'm just doing or in my journal or in my thoughts or while i'm working out is a great time to do it or while i'm driving or a combination of all the things like i'm getting myself into the vibration through my thoughts and words and ideas and imaginations and mostly more than anything these feelings in my body because that's where you attract fun like I'm doing that all the time when I like am intentionally ready for the next like desired outcome but like the good news is that as like your default not trying that hard standards go up like you're just kind of you get to be in periods of just like maintenance you know and then other periods of striving but you're not always always reaching toward the next thing unless you choose to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely does. That that was what I was going to ask you next was kind of like how you can explain the like energetic minimum and energetic maximum. So if someone's making, you know, a thousand dollars a month, (laughs) you know, for, for the really beginner level. Um, I've been there. Yeah, Yeah, totally. We all have to start somewhere. (laughs) So like that it's the same thing. You're just getting in that like holy shit I just had a $1,500 a month totally yeah I don't like you would be like I don't even know where the extra 500 came from it just appeared it just worked out it just went my way it just went my favor holy shit there's an extra 500 holy shit there's an extra 500 Mm -hmm. it is here it is mine it is now and for some for me saying words like that is the easiest way to feel a vibrational like shift in my like physical body um other people it's like visualization some people it's definitely movement a combination is always helpful but and it's like the other thing is like this is a big thing when you're new at it you have to understand that for your whole life you've been setting forth certain outcomes into motion and you've been playing by certain rules and you've been living in certain energies so when you start to create new ones and you start to like, you know, create new dynamics and paradigms and patterns for yourself, like there's often a bit of a lag time. Like the universe takes a minute to catch up because you've been putting other shit in motion for like 30 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, you'll probably, you often people see little miracles and little like, oh my God, it's working pretty fast. But sometimes depending on how far away the desire, depending on the, how big the difference is between your desire and your current reality, like sometimes the rearranging takes a while, you know? So like you kind of have to stay with it for a bit for most of us. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. What you just said about the lag. Yeah, I mean, it's with everything. I mean, you don't see results right away. (laughs) Totally. And often we'll have, like I have this like kind of experience of like, for a lot of people, money was waiting for them to act. Like money was owed to them in one way or another, some kind of refund, some kind of something from a family member in some way money was trying to come to them. And then it's like the sec- the first time they try to manifest, the first time they enroll in one of my courses, like something crazy happens right away. Mm-hmm. And to me, that just says it was always available, but you weren't open. The second you opened, it showed up. So there's that experience, which is awesome. But then there's like another experience of like, I just am like, I'm kind of in this like holding thing where like, I know I'm doing the work and I'm feeling something different inside, but I'm not seeing a lot of things outside yet, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what would you suggest, you know, for those, you know, with, you know, just like not making $300,000 a month, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> well, it's like it's four fifty on the good months. Three like I yeah, you and I made three hundred in over a year. But I'm just saying that's my like that's my the world is falling apart number. That's right. like my you know yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and everyone listening, we are all we are all capable of having those things too. A hundred percent. I'm not you know that special. I just am willing to be really radical and audacious with money. Yeah. You know, yeah. For sure. I, I totally love that. Um, how do you as far as like setting those like energetic minimums. So mm -hmm. again, if someone's making a thousand dollars a month, is it, you know, I guess what's that risky thing where you feel like, okay, like, well, yeah, I'd love to be making $10,000 a month, but like, is that something that we should not should, I hate that word, but is it something we should quote unquote, like, like, like get in that energy of now, or should we get into like more of like, okay, well maybe, maybe I should like look for 2000 first. I think it's whatever you can get your mind and energy behind. And what I mean by that is whatever you can believe is possible. So like mm -hmm. for me over all these years, when, you know, an early business goal for me was 3000 a month, which seemed insane. And then it got to like 4,500 and that was such a big deal. Cause that was like 50,000 a year. And that was insane. And like, and I like, I guess, and then I went from like 4,500 to like 6,000, then eight, then 11. But once I got to 11, I went, I think I can double this. And I went 20, but then I went from like 20 to 40. And like, I remember having a $76,000 a month. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm sure I want to tell this right. That would have been 2000. I mean, maybe two years from the first $11,000 a month is like $76,000 a month. And then, you know, a year after that was six figure months. And a year after that, we're a quarter of a million dollar month. So, I mean, it, like I say all that to say is I pick numbers based on what I can get behind, what I can believe is possible for me. The idea for me is that it should be a little bit of a stretch, like feel a little bit impossible and ridiculous, but also like, yeah, I can do that. So right. like when you hear that journey, there's obvious moments where my confidence like was improving and I went, I can double this, but like other moments where it was more like, whoa, this amount of money I just made kind of freaks me out. I have to now just believe I can maintain this for a minute. It was both, you know? So if someone's at a thousand and 3000 makes them like, like want to look at us like we're crazy, then I maybe wouldn't go 3000. I'd go 2,500, you know? Cause right. like the whole, like, even when I was working on like six thousand dollars a month. I knew I was going to be a millionaire. You need eighty six thousand a month at least to be to may have a seven figure year, right? So like, I I was always holding like a smaller immediate vision while I was also like reaching toward like a bigger, not quite there yet, but I know where it's where I'm going. Vision, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A little stretch, stretcher, stretch goal <laughs> of it. I like that. Um, so, you know, I feel like everything you say is absolutely powerful and coming from authenticity of course and being extremely like unapologetic and like what you say and how you say things um you know mm -hmm. you, you just have this like belief trust and know like belief trust and knowing in like everything you know that you convey at least on social media let's put it that way <laughs> um you know like what do you do daily like what's like your daily routine to like stay in that um i mean granted you've probably been pro practicing things for a long time i know you have your own like meditations i've listened to them on youtube and your podcast um mm -hmm. but you know is that how is meditation and maybe what are some other ways that you get into that like yeah i just have this belief trust in knowing that i'm you know i'm the money queen and things come to me <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's like it's I don't know. It's like, to be really honest, what it's really like is like, like I said, the default vibration is pretty good. And then in the moments of doubt, I have to choose to realign. So for me, that's through, I'm like, I'm very much like a mental person. I know not everyone's this way, but for me, like I have an easy time, like deciding things just when I look at them, remember they're not, ult not ultimately true, decide a new desire like identify a new desire and decide it gets me my reality and just kind of get like my like energetic and mental stance behind it like I do a good job going like and it is done I have decided it is done and now my job is to live in the mindset that it is done and to be in the vibe of it is done and to attract it being done to me you know so it's like kind of mental for me 
Mm-hmm. And for other people, it's other ways. But like, I've definitely had moments of like the clarity or the decision or the desire coming to me, like in nature or in like a spin class or like it can be many, many different ways. I guess I would say like, the big thing that everyone just needs to know is that it's possible to create shifts within your mind and in your emotion and in your imagination and expectation and all of it. Like it's possible to create the shifts. So like really the work is just noticing what helps you to feel better. Like, Mm -hmm. and just doing that for yourself, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And feeling better about things is obviously helping you to be more in alignment with who you are, stepping more into your boundaries and into your power yeah a hundred percent absolutely so if um you know if a listener if a listener has a business but still works like a nine to five job what mm-hmm. is your advice you know if they're scared to take that leap like or do you advise them to like okay we'll stay in your nine to five until x or is it just the sole fear that's holding them back from going all in on their business and leaving that nine to five space I've definitely had clients do both. I've had clients do both. I've had clients wait until the business hit like a certain amount of money to leave the job. And I have, I've had clients more take the leap of faith and quit the job before the business had the money. And it really has to be based on like your desire, your belief, like what you can get behind as possible for you. Like, I think we're all motivated a little bit differently. For me, I will tell you that the first month my business supported me was the first month it had to. Like I had quit a couple of the jobs. I had renewed, reduced the nannying down six significantly. Like I had like kind of based out of desire and just feeling led. And like it was, there was definitely like a flow happening, you know, like I was working in a uh, Dallas inner city school as a therapist intern. And it was like one by one, I was wrapping up with each of those clients and not taking on a new client. And like one by one, like my nannying clients were kind of like, I was phasing them out and they were getting new nannies. And like, it was like, I was, I knew I was being led on this journey to like release these other sources of income and move my focus to my business. But that first month, the business paid the bills. There just wasn't money from anything else. So the business had to pay the bills. And for me, that is motivating. For someone else, like for, I don't know, just to give an example, based, it's like based on your responsibilities and your bills and your dependence. Like, do you have children? What's going on for you? Like based on those things, something else might feel right or wrong to you, you know, that, but that was what felt right to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good advice. Um, I I'm in that space. So that's why I was wondering. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, just be led. I mean, like set the, I guess, and I've said to a lot of clients, you know, like, and it's been a while because most of my clients now have been entrepreneurs for a long time, but there was a chunk of time where I feel like all of my clients were leaving nine to fives because that was just more like who I was attracting and what I was like in this like place of working on with people. And like, I remember with many of them, just like having them set an intention for how leaving the job would go, like how it would go, how it would feel, how the people at the job would react, how they would feel like just the outcome for it all. And like what the time left at the job would be like was another big thing. Like, how are you supported and compensated and what are the dynamics that are going on as you're still there? Like it isn't meant to be like often people will make the job start to suck as bad as possible because they're looking for more reasons to leave. So they start like manifesting like nonsense at the job, which isn't great. But I mean, it makes sense because we're all just trying to do what we desire to do. And so we're subconsciously creating that all the time. Right. But like, I definitely had a client years ago who like one day her employer fucking doubled her income and gave her Fridays off. And mm-hmm. she was like, okay, I can stay one more year while I build the business. And yeah. she did. And it was kind of perfect. You know, it was like that one last year, she felt so much more compensated. She felt so much better and she was willing to be there another year. But she knew that year was to prepare, prepare her for leaving. She knew she couldn't be like sucked back into it, you know, so it was the perfect outcome for her. So I think that's kind of the thing. You got to decide how you want it to go and you get to be open for like it coming through in various miraculous ways because we never really know how it's going to come through, you know, Mm -hmm. and anyone listening saying like, that's not possible at my job. I mean, that's not possible at any job. She was like an office manager for a pediatrician, like doubling her pay and giving her Fridays off was like based on nothing besides 
he just did one day, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know that, that, that was really good advice. Thank you. It is. And uh, you're welcome. Also, I mean, and also it is the energy that you get behind it. I mean, that's where I, yeah. have, I mean, I had to have a lot of, um, I made a lot of mindset shifts. So I actually took two years off of being in corporate to try and pursue health coaching at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, then I had worked with a couple of coaches, one being Aaron and, I had gone through like the show, all this stuff. I thought my, my like whole like world, it just felt like it was like flipped upside down. And I, yeah. was, I was pivoting after working with Erin. I was like, holy shit. Like she just rocked my world. I want to do this. I don't want to talk about nutrition anymore. I don't want to do health coaching. <laughs> so mm -hmm. started, you know, pivoting my business, but that meant like everyone else was feeling that transition. And I definitely was recognizing a lot of my like deep rooted stories of like people pleasing and, you know, obviously not honoring my boundaries because I like had one toe in the business and mindset coaching and one toe still in the health coaching. And so like mm -hmm. my audience didn't know, like, what, what are you doing, Kelly? <laughs> what are you doing? How can you really help me? Cause you're talking about this, but then you're talking about this and we just like, don't even know. So anyways, I got myself into some financial situation and I thought the best thing was like, yes, I need, I need like corporate work because I was not in the belief and trust in knowing <laughs> that everything was going to pan out. Like there was fears mm -hmm. and there was me listening to my parents for a while be like, Kelly, you need to fucking get a job. Like you're going to be homeless oh. if you don't, you know? So, yeah. I mean, obviously I probably just exaggerated the way that you said that language, but <laughs> that's how it felt. <laughs> um, you know, but yeah, I got it, but I had to have a lot of shifts around it because I was like, okay, I am obviously going to use this new corporate job to, you know, have like peace of mind. Like I don't have to feel like I'm running a business to get clients. Like, yeah. you know, or to just make giving money. yourself space where you're not putting pressure on the clients. Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly. So it was, I was just more like, you know, just more peaceful financially with my business and obviously just like with my life in general at that time. So yeah, it was helpful. Um, obviously like going through your courses and, you know, just do, doing my <laughs> work and stuff. I was able to pay off debt within like a year and a half. So yay for me. <laughs> I got there. Um, but yeah, so, but again, I just Kelly kept telling myself like, Kelly, it's not like you don't have to think that you failed in your business or anything like that. Like it's, you created an opportunity for yourself, period. Like to support yourself, to support this vision that you have. And as you build and grow that things will come. And it has just been so much more peaceful of a journey now that I'm there. And I'm, you know, yeah, I have these, visions of me like okay it's almost time like that I probably leave the nine to five because I'm finding myself exhausted because I'm working 14 hour days a lot <laughs> so that's not yeah. that's not healthy um so anyways um but that was helpful so thank you for that um You're welcome. so I kind of want to shift gears a little bit I like I said at the beginning we had this like small world synchronicity of like working with a, uh, the same love coach and the only reason I know that is because she shared something or maybe you shared something of hers like on your Instagram and I was like wait a second did y'all like work together <laughs> so um anyways you obviously from what I can see on social media of course like I said you have this beautiful loving relationship I would say that you are absolutely in love that's how it seems. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. We're in love. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And they're, the children are absolutely adorable. Um, yeah. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Um, but Thank I want I would love for you to kind of share, if, if you don't mind, like share a little bit of that, like of that relationship journey, like where were you before? Did you, I mean, like, why would you have worked with a love coach? Oh, I worked with so many. I worked with at least oh, okay. four. Okay. Yeah, I worked with, I, <laughs> I worked okay. with a handful of them. Yeah. All wonderful and delightful and unique in their, you know, in their own various ways and various approaches, like all very effective, um, you know, and like with anything, love or money or anything, it's like, we're always led to the like right person for us based on what we need to learn next, you know, but I would say to give you a bit of the love journey, it felt a bit like I didn't understand men and I didn't know why. Like, I didn't know why. Like, it just felt like this big question marky thing. Like, why do I find myself like in these situations over and over and over again where like my abandonment fear is like triggered 
and it feels like a guy's not doing what I thought he would do or wanted him to do. Why do it, does it feel like all the men around me like won't men like man up? And the most frustrating part is that I understand like how energy works. So I kind of like knew that like anything occurring, I am attracting. So like anything happening on repeat, like I am causing on repeat, like I knew the idea that all men are bad or all men are this or all men are that or men just don't do this or that anymore. It was like not true, but like, I didn't know how to like get out of the rut. So I think what finally happened, what really, really finally shifted everything for me was like this period of time of just like, I don't even know what to call it. It was like a reconciliation of my soul (laughs) for lack of a better words. It was a period of time where like I just felt and processed and like journaled on and released and cried about every painful like love memory I could think of. Like I just, like I just let myself be so wounded and so triggered and like I just held and so angry and like I just held the shit out of myself and I just like journaled and released and processed and like it felt like this like releasing chunk of time but I think the important part of it was that like I got close to my own heart I got so much closer to my own self like I finally became like the best I don't know safe space and partner for myself that I ever could have been and like I would say there were two more components to that working at the same time I was also just loving the shadow to myself so like taking bath, and this is during the pandemic right so taking baths and taking walks and just like I don't know, like eating food in bed and like watching a movie, which for my very productive, a little bit like maybe uh, workaholic y like self, I, w- I was just like in more self care and more self love than I've ever been in, right? Like with the way I was just nurturing myself and my body. So we had the nurturing going on, we had the getting close to my own heart going on. And then I did this radical thing where like I stopped viewing men as these things that were supposed to check boxes for me to prove they were good enough for me. And I started treating them as people, as human souls. Revolutionary. So as soon as men became people that my only intention was to connect with and get to know, and my only job was to be my delightful self around them and be so full of love inside myself that I needed nothing from them, it was like every man I dated couldn't get enough of me. It was like, it was like the easiest thing in the world. Finally, just letting men be men, not disqualifying them all the time, saying they're not this enough, not that enough. They didn't call in time. All the stuff women do. I've dropped all of it and I just loved their souls. That was it. And then, um, my boyfriend and I had dated a bit like the year before and he had come back into my life as a friend. And I kind of just like, blamed him for nothing, let him off the hook for everything, which I know sounds crazy because I think, I think we're, our fear is that men will treat us so badly if we do all of this, but I got the opposite result. I got a lot of men worshiping me when I stopped making them wrong all the time. Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I think, yes, of course, there's like people not living in the light and spirit of love always, but I think the vast majority of male like people who identify as men on this planet want to make women happy more than they want anything else ever. So like once they were able to make me happy, once I could let them win with me and win with them continually and express in love and gratitude, how happy they made me when they did this and that and the other, it was like, it was like the veil was lifted and everything I had tried to work on for all the years before that just felt like not the thing (laughs) to be honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you were saying about um, just allowing yourself to like sit with your wounds and kind of go back through like all of, you know, all of the situations, all of the experiences that wounded you and that you felt triggered in and just allowed yourself to like get mad and be sad because you were probably bypassing those emotions before. And that's why they were tucked inside of you and keeping you stuck, you know? From- right. But I had no idea I was bypassing them. Like it didn't, like it didn't come up in therapy. It didn't come up in any love coaching. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even know they were there. Right. So like letting that all happen was like definitely a big part of it. But then the other two parts, I think were equally as important, you know, 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a huge advocate on, you know, just like focusing on you and doing the, that self-love. I mean, I take myself on like solo dates because I'm like, okay, well, I may not have a man to take me, but it doesn't mean I have to sit at home. <laughs> like Totally. I, and I did that for years, but I did it while not feeling love. Like I took myself on 1 million vacations and one month. Like, I mean, right. I lived the life I wanted to live. I was at five-star resorts all the time. Like I was doing whatever the fuck I wanted to do, but I didn't wasn't experiencing like love inside myself inside of them. I could have been, I just wasn't, but it was through the simpler things, like just a bath in the vibe of love or just putting on my makeup in the vibe of love, like just doing things in the vibe of love for me, you know, which you could definitely do on a date or anywhere. I just hadn't, you know? Absolutely. And I'm sure that, I mean, you probably just brought awareness to many women listening in too. <laughs> just, you know, I think we all do that. We're not aware that we're doing the things that we do, but we are, totally. are very aware that the same situation keeps happening to us. <laughs> totally. Like you can be at a manicure feeling nurtured or you can be at a manicure feeling like annoyed at the manicurist. Like, I mean, all the emotions are always available. I think I just finally went into feeling loved. Like I would feel loved by the sunshine. I would feel loved by the sidewalk. I was just like feeling yeah. loved. Loved by the back. I was just feeling loved. So when you're feeling loved, you're going to like attract more feelings of being loved. But I think I repelled or not. I mean, like, it's not like I have, I don't know, hard feelings with all the men I've dated over the years. And dear God, there were a lot of them. We all ended fine. I don't think any of them would have told you a bad thing about me, but something in me clearly made each and every one of them for some reason think like, eh, she's not the one. Well, on one hand, I wasn't the one. That's true. On the other hand, I think I didn't learn how to be like, a, um, I bet like through this work, I became like a soft place to land. Does that make sense? I, I became like, a non-critical space for a person to be themselves like you know what I mean I don't think men are not choosing us for the reasons we think you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's like we kind of have to think instead of like he doesn't know how amazing I am we kind of have to think like but why would he like have I given him any reason to think he's like safe with me loved with me you know, that he can go on a journey of growth and healing and like becoming our best selves and building a legacy together? Or did I criticize him for how long he took to do all these things? Because that probably didn't make him think that he wanted to spend his whole life feeling that way with a person, you know? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's like a big thing, you know, just like I said, I was learning a lot of boundaries this last year. Um, I had some relationship stuff. That's why I worked with Nicole. Um, <laughs> so, you know, for me coming out, like in hindsight now, I'm like, wow, you know, it was, you know, there was that safety. Like I didn't feel, I didn't make him feel safe because I didn't feel safe in the relationship. Like I was being vulnerable, but totally. he wasn't ready. And he had told me this, but like, he wasn't ready to give me what I deserve. And he knew what I deserve, but he wasn't, he wasn't ready. He was very aware of himself, but you know, still, I just, I wanted things to be different. <laughs> so of course, like controlling and, and again, me not honoring my boundaries, me not being in that vibe of love of, for myself. It was not totally. So. Yeah. It starts, it starts with us. Like, I think, I think my boyfriend would have told you when we got back together, I think he would have said in the months prior that he wasn't ready. But I, I guess the thing was, I never tried to make him ready. Mm -hmm. I just like, I don't even know how to explain it. I just connected with him. Like forming a deep connection with someone will make them want to be ready. And I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing that women forget about is that men often try to tell us the truth. And we just decide that we can change them. And that's not the vibe either. But if you don't try to change them and you just love them, then sometimes they will just change. You know what I mean? But that's very different energies, you know? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And recognizing, you know, a lot of those uh, behavioral patterns that I was doing and I had done in previous, all of my relationships probably, you know, and I kept mm -hmm. telling myself, you know, after it was all said and done, I was like, you know what, Kelly? Maybe he wasn't showing up for you because you weren't fully showing up for yourself. <laughs> you weren't fully. Isn't that always the fucking thing, you yeah. know? Like, how many times do we have to learn that people are just reflecting stuff to us? Yes. It's so annoying. <laughs> it's so true. It's so, so true. And I was like, you know, okay, he's not ready. 
well, maybe I wasn't ready for that either. Although I wanted it, you know, like, again, I don't, I don't think not to say, not to say that you can't have like your career business relationships, all of them like happening at the same time, but maybe me where I was at, at the time that we were dating, I didn't feel safe with where I was at in my life. So totally. that created the unsafe feeling for him, you know, I don't know. Who yeah. Knows? <laughs> and just like bounced it back and forth off each other all the live long day. All the live um, long day. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say something. Oh, yes, yes, yes. One, similarly, but in my experience, it was like, I would have told you that every man I dated was emotionally unavailable. Like, that's what I, that's how I would have explained it. They feel unavailable. They feel avoidant. That that was like, they feel not there was the, like the continual thing. Like, even when I was enjoying dating someone, there was always this kind of energy of just like, unavailable you know what I mean and when it finally when I finally did all that work of getting like really close to myself I was like huh I was emotionally unavailable to myself and I wouldn't have been able to explain that to you because I was so like aware and willing to process when it came to like family and business and money I felt like I processed emotions so well but like there was this whole kind of chunk of like hurt around love and just feeling worthy of love and just feeling lovable and just like a aban- not like not abandonment not feeling possible anymore because I was so close to my own self you know mm-hmm. um and like Nicole said many many times like you know I would rather lose him than lose me I will never lose me but I didn't like the words sounded nice but they didn't like make sense to me mm-hmm. and now there's just such a deep sense of like well I've got me forever and I don't have to be alone he's got me forever too and I know that like you know not like I got me forever so fuck off I can be single like I've got me forever and that created like a deep enduring partnership energy you know yeah, absolutely. Where like my minimum standard with love would not be to be alone right now. It just wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. And I go off and do things alone all the time. I went on vacation by myself last weekend, but like I'm wildly independent and very supported and connected to a partner, you know? Right. And you can be both. And that's a sure tell. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and another reason why I wanted to ask you to go deeper into relationship, I mean, my podcast is about that, you know, all the things, but, um, just because, yeah, you, you obviously have this presence of like having this like total belief, you know, and knowing about yourself and you seem so, you know, sturdy in all of that. And I guess, you know, the point is like, we really all can do an audit on like every area of our life and really feel into what isn't working or what is not where I really want it to be. And not to say that that was you, but like in that relationship realm and you're like, it was a little off because you were attracting certain things or not attracting certain things because you were emotionally unavailable yeah. for yourself in that regard. But in other areas of your life, everything was fine and magical. <laughs> totally magical. And it was actually very annoying to be someone who understood energy, understood manifestation and like feel so like I wasn't locking it in, in yeah. love. Like I knew I wasn't and I didn't know why. Mm-hmm. And it was really like those three things I explained that were the big shifts for me. So I hope like one or more of those things are like aha moments for someone else, either how they treat men, how they love on themselves or like how they tend to or don't tend to their own hurts, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And how has your, has, have you noticed any shifts in your business or other areas of your life because of this? newfound awakening within yourself for love Mm, no you know what I find interesting with money is like I think anything we choose can be linked up but I don't think they have to be linked up you know Mm. like some people believe when they make more money like love suffers or they believe that like when they fall in love like business and money suffer or other people believe like being supported in a relationship makes them more money. And I think all those links are like all completely made up. You know what I mean? Because like, I don't see them as connected and there really hasn't been much of a change at all. Like my business has been like, you know, like stably like maintaining and like glow, like growing 
I would say the second half of 2021 was like very like stable, you know, like growth, but like not like big shots upward. It was just, you know, whatever. And that's when I was like establishing my relationship. Um, I would say the only thing that is different is I just have now a partner supporting me in all of it. So like just talking through business stuff, just talking through like life and choices and money, like you just have one more person that like has your best interests at, at heart. And that like means like a lot, like that, like very much comfort me and means a, means a lot to me, but I don't feel like anything in me goes. And that means I make more or less money though. I could believe that if I chose, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything is, can be a story <laughs> that we tell ourselves. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And like, it's just so funny how people like try to decide that things create other things, but it's just ideas. Like, you know, when it comes to money, like if you, it doesn't take long to listen to people who teach on money and someone's going to tell you it's connected to orgasms and someone else is going to tell you it's connected to your crystals and someone else is going to tell you it's connected to the moon and someone else is going to tell you it's connected to how much fun you're having. And it's like, all of those things can contribute if those help you shift your vibration, but you and your vibration was always the only thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. It just is because it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. It just is. Yeah. It just is. Yeah. Um, so you I'll, I'll wrap it up shortly, but you do riffs. I think you're the first person I've ever like I didn't maybe I mean I've heard the word riff before, but like it's just like a more known thing now because you do this. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Isn't it funny when you scroll through the internet and you see words that you never saw used the way they're being used until you did it? And you're like, yeah, I don't even, it's a very weird thing. I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's constant. Like I kind of created a thing. I didn't even know I was doing it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, I've obviously, I have honestly adopted this too, because like, I will be like, wow, is this like, is this what she's doing? Like, I mean, it's just like a doubt, like all of a sudden I'll be in my bathtub and I'm like, holy shit. And I just like start like just writing a caption in my notes, you know, on my phone. And I'm like, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, is, you know, is that what that is? It's like a download from source basically. Is that what a riff is? Kind of. Yes. It feels like, so I have like a Christian background. It feels to me like I just went into preacher mode or something. <laughs> it just feels like I'm explaining it and I'm explaining it well and I'm explaining it fast. I don't even know where it came from, but what I'm saying is good and I won't remember it. You should probably take notes. <laughs> That's how it yeah. feels, you know? That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I love it. Keep doing it because they, I mean, it does. It, it makes total sense too. When I read your captions, I'm like, yes. <laughs> like, totally. Super, yeah. Super powerful. So who, mm-hmm. um, who would you say is like the, you know, someone that you've always looked up to, or maybe like a, one of your greater men- mentors? I haven't had all that many. Okay. Um, I had a transformational moment like a decade ago when my coaching business um, was a baby and I saw spirit junkie, Gabby Bernstein's book at a Barnes and Noble. That was like a moment for me of, I had been looking and asking for answers and I knew how to manifest without knowing to use that word, right? Like I knew it from, like I said, like a Christian foundation of like, a, like, um, like, you know, the Bible says, speak that this mountain be cast into the sea and believe it in your heart and it'll be done kind of vibes. Like I knew I was a creator, but I didn't know how to do it. And I feel like Gabby was part of the foundation of like, I don't know, just putting names to things and um, like conceptualizing these thoughts in my head more easily, you know, so that was a moment. And then an early, I don't want to say early, like a a midway through the journey business coach for me was Katrina Roof. We worked together for like maybe a couple years. And when I met her, you know, I was making like $50,000 a month. I knew I was meant to be a multimillionaire and I just didn't know very many women making more money than me. And she was at the time. And I like, I was like, Hey, can I hire you? And it was just like, I'm like the worst and the best client. Like in the sense, I like never book calls. I like never use my sessions, but like I text questions when I have a question more than anything. I just watch how a coach or a mentor like does the things. Yeah. Like how they operate, what they believe, and what it's like for them. So I feel like it was kind of like an osmosis kind of 
couple of years of just like seeing how she did the things and what she believed about the things and letting like launching and selling and the internet as a whole be easy was yeah. kind of how she does it. And that was big for me. So that was a moment in my journey for sure. And then the only other thing that comes to mind is there was significant time for like several years of just having Abraham Hicks like playing in the background, Mm -hmm. like a lot. And you know, like when something's like playing in the background, you're like, you're kind of picking up on it, like your conscious and your subconscious are like, kind of intermittently engaged. I think, I think I soaked some of it up, you know, because sometimes I'll just say something and someone will be like, you'll say Abraham Hicks, I'll be like, haven't but like (laughs) there's some foundational truths in there that like kind of anchored into me and the same thing with a course in miracles and the bible they're like all in there you know (laughs) yeah absolutely and they come out kind of at different times absolutely well okay back step about like just um religion and stuff like i know like (laughs) i was i tuned into your book your like launch your virtual book launch party yesterday Uh, yeah Yeah. Uh And you kind of like touched on this, like about that you pair cuss words with, you know, like spirituality. (laughs) Yeah. Like saying God and fuck in the same sentence was the best branding move of my life. I just didn't know it. Yeah. Uh Yeah, exactly. Like how, I guess, because you, you know, you are religious, but then you're also spiritual, I guess, you know, there's just, there's controversial, like whatever out there, but like, you know, I guess it's like, how did you get to that place? I just loved God and I eventually realized that like God didn't really care that much what word I used. It was more about like the energy and the intention behind the word, you know, Mm -hmm. like you can say a very loving fuck or you can say a very hateful fuck. And it just became obvious to me that like so much of the religion I had been taught or I had come to understand wasn't really like based on anything besides rules and ideas, you know. So I kind of like dropped the rules and ideas and I kind of just kept like the essence of what I felt to be true about the God that I felt I knew, you know? And when that happened, I was able to like apply God to business so easily, apply God to money, apply God to anything. Cause I just felt like I was taking the loving creator of all and letting that like energy, like work with me, you know, and everything I was doing. So it was kind of like, I don't know, for many years, I would have told you that I probably wasn't a Christian, you know, it didn't seem like it it fit anymore. And then I got to LA where there's so much diversity and so many different religious backgrounds that I got here. And I was like, Oh, I probably am a Christian because like, you know, like when there's just like, there wasn't a lot of like Jewish people (laughs) or Muslims in Oklahoma, you know, so I got here and I'm like, Oh, that Christianity is a big part of like, my like foundation and like family heritage and belief systems I didn't understand but it's but it's like I can listen to a church service and get so much because I studied the bible for so long while believing that a big chunk of what the pastor said is bullshit like but I have the discernment from like a lot of years of like study and learning if that makes sense yeah. mm-hmm. so like it doesn't really fit into the labels which just like I love god I say fuck I believe God put co-creative power inside of us that we can do miraculous things with. And that's like my deal, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with everything in life, it's about how you feel and yeah, it's about how you feel about things. And even like you were saying, there's like with uh, certain religions, it's about rules and ideologies and it's like, okay, are those necessarily, are those like just stories and beliefs too that, you know, we can choose to, totally and what yeah and what am I subscribing to you know what I mean like if someone tells you a bible certain bible story means a certain thing like do you blindly subscribe to that you know or do you weigh it in your heart it's a very different experience absolutely yeah no I love that I'm sure I could talk more about that but (laughs) in respect of your time um I obviously I would love for you to share um about your book because you are literally launching your book like people are buying it (laughs) right now yeah it's it's like for sale it's the wildest thing so um I wrote a book I put you know I guess a couple decades you know of teaching and study and learning and exploring the topic of money like into one book I I, yeah it's like it's all there there's a chapter on like debt and eliminating debt and there's a chapter on like 
savings and a chapter on like spending and releasing money. And there's a lot on earning and receiving money. And it's like, it's all there. And it has journal prompts with every chapter to help you like, um, really dig into your like core beliefs around all these different topics and like unearth the stuff that's not serving you and like create new ideas and beliefs and like so I just, between the journal prompts and the teaching and the way I explain it and I break it down, like people are like loving this book and I'm so thankful. It's like my first one yeah. and it was such a journey to write it. It took me 15 months, but I did it and yeah, it's a number one, it was a number one, the ebook became a number one uh, Amazon bestseller in like 10 categories the first day and we've just been kind of, kind of riding the wave of that for the past few weeks. It's been really fun. It's so fun. And yeah, I mean, like I said, I have the Kindle version right now and I've already, you know, dived into a lot of it. I'm like, but I love, you know, having the tangible in my hands. So that the the highlighting and writing notes is nice. You know, I think there's something to that. Yeah, it is. And I'm just, I just love that. Like, I just like love feeling the pages, smelling the pages. It's just, that's what feels good for me. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's fun to mark up a book. A lot of people are getting both like summer people are saying, well, I just want it to be on my phone, you know, the ebook mm-hmm. so I can grab it anytime, but I also want to like study it and highlight it and take notes right. around it. So like a lot of black people are buying two copies. I'm not mad about that. You know, as soon as studios open up in LA and I can record, which might take several months based on the situations right now oh, right. but once I can record I'll do an audible then there'll be three versions to buy and eventually we'll do a hardback I mean then I want to do like uh like affirmation cards and like yeah. a calendar with affirmations like I'm kind of gonna go on with this rich as fuck thing forever yeah but um <laughs> people can start with the paperback or the ebook right now yeah, absolutely. And I highly, highly recommend it. Like everybody needs a copy <laughs> for sure. Um, it you. will radically change your, change your life. Um, so where can people find you um, besides your book? Um, if you want to tell them about any programs going on right now? Um, let's see, what would be the best place to get people? Well, just for social media, I'm XO Amanda Francis on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, and on where else am I? Twitter and TikTok, but I never TikTok anymore, but all the places. XO Amanda Francis, F R A N C E S. And then as far as I'm just gonna give like a couple of good free resources. So if you just go to AmandaFrances.com, the page you will land on will be the Boss Lady Meditation series, and there's a slew of free meditations. So it'd be great to go there. Alternatively, if you want some resources on money, you can go to amandafrancis.com slash money, and that will lead you to the Money Mentality Makeover waitlist page, which, which basically means I notify you when Money Mentality Makeover reopens in probably another month. But beside that, whether you are interested in doing a course with me or not, when you opt into that waitlist, you get a whole slew of like money manifesting, money creating, money making kind of resources, just trainings I've created over the years. So Boss Lady Meditation Series and Money Mentality Resources would be two great places. To just go get some free stuff from me right now. And then you'll be on my email list and I can tell you other things that go on sale, you know, and things like that. And I send a lot, I send a ton of resources via email. Yeah. And your emails are amazing too. I mean, they're, you got the riff going on in there as well. And I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I try to keep them very heart centered to where like, if you're not interested in the thing that I'm promoting or selling, like you still feel really enriched by the email, yeah. you know, cause so many people do that so poorly and like, yeah, I want people to feel good after the email, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and you are on YouTube and you have a podcast as well. Um, and she rises the fuck up, right? <laughs> yeah, the podcast is and you can type in Amanda Francis or and she rises. But yes, the whole title is and she rises the fuck up. We like to put fuck in things so people aren't offended when they hear me cuss a lot. So it's not like it's oh, I can't believe she's cussing on this podcast. It's like where fuck was in the title, so you kind of can't believe it. You know? Right. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's what I should start doing because my mo- my mother has a very difficult time with me using that word on social media. <laughs> I'm like, mom. I just put it in all the titles, yeah, and then everyone leaves you alone about it. I don't know if that'll make your mom leave you alone about it, but it's helped other people leave me alone about it. <laughs> like I used to get like reviews and stuff that would say all oh, the cursing. 
And it's like, well, don't buy a program that says fuck in it if you're offended by cursing, you know? Right, exactly. Yeah. What was drawing you to it in the first place? <laughs> totally. Like we let you know from the beginning when yeah. we entitled it, drop the motherfucking money struggle, you know, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I put awesome. fuck in the name. So you were warned. Yeah. You have been warned. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Everyone go follow, find Amanda and um, uh, go buy her book, Rich as Fuck. <laughs> it is amazing. There, there's another one. Yeah. <laughs> go buy the book. If you need anything from me or my team about anything we've talked about, you can email assistant at amandafrances.com. And I'm on the Insta stories all day long. So I'll see you guys on the interwebs. Absolutely. Thanks, girlfriend.